So today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be graphing a line using slope intercept. Now converting the equation into slope intercept is basically going to be so we can visually notice what's going on with the equation itself. Graphing in and of itself isn't necessarily the most useful of mathematical tools, but it does give us mathematical insight to allow us to see what's going on, maybe to check somewhere else. So graphing a line using slope intercept, we're going to be graphing this in what we call y equals mx plus b format. m being the slope, or what we call rise over run, and b being the y-intercept, where it crosses a vertical line. And so let's take a look at each one of these. Our first one, we have a y-intercept of 1, which means we're going to place a point at the spot of 1. The 2 is our slope. And we know any whole number 2 is understood to be over a 1. And so what we're going to do is because 2 is positive, positive rise means that this is going up 2. 1, a positive run, means it's going to the right 1. But what other number equals 2 other than 2 divided by 1? Well, you could do a negative 2 divided by negative 1, which would still divide out to equal 2, equals 2. But a negative rise would mean that this is going down. A negative run means this is going left. So we notice that if I go up and right, so up 2, right 1, and down to back 1, I end up getting a straight line. So everything is all good. So it doesn't matter if we have up and right or down and left. We're going to end up with points that exist all along the exact same line. And what I like to do is I always like to label my line y equals 2x plus 1. It's not really a requirement at the stage because there's only one line on that graph. But once we get to the point where we're graphing multiple lines on a graph, it helps clarify which is which. So let's move on to the next one. In this case, I have a y-intercept at negative 1, which means I put a point down here. And then I have a slope of 1 half, which means earlier, that means I can either go up and right, or if I change both their signs, I could go down and left. And let's see if it creates a straight line. Up 1 over 2 or down and left. And yes, that does create a straight line. So let's go ahead, let's graph that line and label it. Y is 1 half x minus 1. Perfect. And the next one tells us two different things. The first thing we notice is that I have no y-intercept shown. It's still there. So ask yourself, what can I add or subtract to an equation that doesn't show up? Well, zero. Zero is something I can add or subtract that I won't actually need to write, which means my intercept is at the origin. And the slope here is negative 2.5. That means we could either go down 2.5 and over 1, which in my opinion puts us at a halfway point, or we could convert that to a fraction and say, okay, negative 2.5. I know that first decimal place is called the tenths spot, which means this whole thing is a tenth. So negative 2.5 is a tenth. Or if I were to reduce that, that's a 5 half as a slope. And I know negative 5 over a positive 2 means down and right, or if I reverse it, it would mean up and left. So down and right, or up and left. And we notice that it doesn't matter which, they're all along the same line. Oh, 
y equals negative 2.5x. Perfect. And so that's slope intercept. So what happens if my equation is given to me in slope intercept and I still want to graph using this method? Well, all that's going to be required of us is that we isolate our y variable, which means that I'm going to have to move the x over. And so I'm going to draw a slightly slanted line as we start moving things away. We need to move the x over, so I'm going to add a 2x to both sides, and that gets rid of it over there. And I'm left with a 5y is equal to 2x plus 20. These aren't like terms, so I can't combine them. I leave them separate. And then the next thing is I divide everything by 5. So I'm left with a y is equal to 2 fifths x. 20 divided by 5 is going to give me a 4. And so my two bits of information is I have a slope intercept of positive 4. And because I can't go up to over 5, my only choice is to go down and left. And there we go. And so you see that sometimes the slope doesn't give us a choice of what we want. We can't do both, we only have one option to move. And that's mainly because my graphs are very, very small. The second thing is I can label this either with my new equation or my old. I tend to like to list them in this order. So y is 2 fifths x plus 4. There we go. So what we see next is what happens if I go to try and squish something on a graph that's 5 by 5, or 5 by 5 in the positive direction, it's actually a 10 by 10. This one won't fit on there, but we're not quite there yet, so let's take a look at what's going on. So when I look at this equation, I see a fraction, and most of us realize that to get rid of a fraction, a fraction is just a division that's been paused. So to get rid of a divide by 9, we're going to go ahead and multiply everything by 9. The x gets multiplied by 9, and this whole term gets multiplied by 9, which cancels out. So 9x is equal to 5y minus 136. Not 136, just 36. And some of you might ask, why didn't the y and the 36 get multiplied by 9? Well, when I distribute, I only go one layer deep, and I'm going inside one set of parentheses. I don't go in a second time, just once. Same as what we're about to do right here. I only go once into the parentheses. 9x is 5y minus, let's see, we have a 5 by 36. We know that 5 times 30 is going to give me 150. We know 5 times 6 is going to give me 30, so that's going to give me 180. And then I add that over here to move it away from my y. So I have a 9x plus 180 is equal to 5y. And then I divide everything on both sides of the equation by 5. And in this case, I get 9 fifths x plus 36 is equal to y. And that's the same thing if I swap swapped them. y is 9 fifths x plus 36. These are the same equation, just written in different orders. So what I notice is that my graph no longer fits a 36. I'm going to have to make them a little bigger. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say these are by 10s. I don't need to actually write out 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 but I need to show that my graph has been scaled back, which allows me to put a point at 10, 20, 30, 6. And I can go up 9, which is almost a full block, and over 5, or down 9, which is almost a full block, and over 5. And this is going to give me a straight line that looks something like this. Now again, because my points are so small, this may not be the 100% most accurate graph, but it gets the point across. 
Remember, this just gives us an intuition as to how things work. Cool. And the last one, this is an equation where we're plugging in values. So I'm gonna take my p-value and plug that in, and then I'm gonna take my b-value and I'm gonna plug that in. So the equation is actually x equals y minus a p-value of 12 and a b-value of nine. So when I look at that equation, I see two things. Get rid of the divide by nine by multiplying by nine, cancels out, but I do have a nine x. Add my 12 to both sides, and I get 9x plus 12 is equal to y, or if I swip swapped it, 9x plus 12. It doesn't matter which order you put it in, they both get the same thing. I have an intercept 12. I'm going to make this a little bigger. Let's call it by threes. So 36912 can't go up, so I'm going to go back, down and back. So 3, 6, 9, back 1, 3, 6, 9, back 1, 3, 6, 9, back 1. Regardless, these are going to form a straight line right through here, which I got either listed as this, the original, or that, the new. And there we go. So today we're going to be graphing a line using standard form. Now this is different than what we did yesterday where we converted it to slope intercept form and graphed. Today we're gonna to be graphing using the X and Y intercepts. Does that mean that we can't use slope intercept form? Absolutely not. You can still use this format and graph a line. However, we're gonna be using the X and Y intercepts because we're gonna see this method being used in things like quadratics and polynomials because x-intercepts and y-intercepts are gonna be important points on graphs. But because we're still dealing with lines, you can still get away with using both. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, we know that our x-intercept is where it crosses the x-axis, which means there is no vertical motion. It is at the zero part, which means there is no height. The y is equal to zero. So what I'm going to do is say 4x plus 0 for my y equals 0 and solve the equation from here. Well, I know that 0 cancels out. I have 4x equals 0, which means x equals 0. So I'm going to put a point right here in the center of my graph. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to find my y-intercept. And I'm going to ask, where does it intercept my graph on the vertical line? That means there's no left or right motion, which means my width is 0 in this case. So I'm going to plug in 4 times a width of 0 plus y is equal to 0. Well, I know that cancels out, so I have y is equal to 0. So my y-intercept is also right here. So what we notice is that if we have a case where both intercepts are at zero, we have to find another method, either by using a table or by converting this using slope-intercept form. So let's take a look at what would happen. To subtract my 4x, I get y equals negative 4x. Which means my slope is down 1, 2, 3, 4, and over by 1. Or if I put the negative on the other part, it's positive 4 over a negative 1. And I'm going to connect those two points with a line. I'm going to label it for x plus y equals 0. So we see sometimes this method doesn't work if both intercepts are on top of each other. Because through any two points exist a line. What happens if both points are on top of each other? Well. I'm not graphing on the z-axis, I'm graphing on the x-y-axis. Let's take a look at the next one. 
In this case, when I'm dealing with the x-intercept, I want my y to be 0. When I'm dealing with the horizontal line, I want no height in the graph. So I'm going to deal with x plus a 0 is equal to negative 3. So what I know is that the 0 cancels out. I have x equals negative 3. So I put my point right there. Now, for my y-intercept, this is where I want no width. So I don't want to move left or right. I just want to move up or down on the y-axis. So I'm going to plug in a 0 for x. So I have 0 plus y is negative 3. That cancels out. My y is negative 3. Now, unlike the first one, where they were both 0, that's at the same point on the graph. If I have a negative 3 and a negative 3 for x and y, those are at different points on our graph. So we have the ability to connect those two points with a straight line, not requiring an extra dimension. I'm going to put my line. I'm going to label it x plus y equals negative 3. And I'm going to box that up so I know which line that is. If I have something like this, where I'm dealing with y is equal to negative 2, well, if we remember from yesterday, we said that if we've eliminated the variable, we're looking at either a true or untrue statement. So here, if I ask if x equals 2, does y equal negative 2? Yes. If I say does x equal 0, does y equal negative 2? Well, yes. If I say if x equals negative pi over e, does y equal negative 2? Yes. So what it sounds like is it sounds like x has infinite solutions by the appearances because x doesn't matter. But when I actually graph this at negative 2, I know at x equals 2, y is still negative 2. And at x equals all of these values, I get a horizontal line. So I know that these aren't solutions per se, but they fit in the graph because they have no bearing. So let's take a look at another one. In this case, I have x equals negative 1 half, which means that I'm going to put my intercept at negative 1 half. And I'm going to ask myself, because I have no y, can y equal 5? Well, yeah. Can y equal 100? Well, yeah. Can y equal negative infinity? Also yes. So it sounds like that y has infinite solutions. Which means that it is a completely vertical line. So we know that this does not matter as long as we've eliminated it from the equation. So let's have something with a little bit more of a challenge on it. So with these values, I know to find my x-intercept, I need to be able to plug in a height of 0 or a y of 0, which means I have 18x plus 2 times my 0 value, which is going to end up canceling out. I'll have 18x equals 8. If I divide both by 18, I get x equals 8 over 18, or 4 over 9, which that's just about a half. If I want to find my y-intercept, I'm going to plug in a 0 width, or when I write out the equation, 18 times 0 plus 2y equals 8. In this case, it's a little easier to work because it's going to end up being a whole number y is equal to 4. So if I have x of 4 ninths, which is just about a half, and y is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, I can connect those points with a straight line. And I'm going to label it 18x plus 2y equals 8. 
Now, many of you might have said, hey, I can reduce that. And I could reduce this, and I would get the same two points. So I don't view it as 100% a necessary step, but it is something that might make your life a little easier. So the last one, if I look at number 11, I have the general form of a standard, uh, standard form of a line, AX plus BY equals C. I gave you an A, a B, and a C value. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in my A of 6, so 6X, six plug in my B of negative 9, minus 9Y, and plug in my C of 3. Now I can solve this. And just to see that reduction doesn't have any effect on the final outcome, what I'm going to do is I've noticed that 3, 6, and 9 are all divisible by 3. So I'm going to reduce this to a 2x minus 3y equals 1. And I know this because I can take the entire equation and multiply it by 1 third or divide it by 3. So here we go. I have my x-intercept, which means I have a 0 height. So I have 6x minus 9 times a zero height, which will eventually cancel out. 6x equals 3, which means x equals 3, 6, or 1 half. For my y-intercept, I know I need a zero width, which means my x is going to be zero. So I'm going to plug in 6 times 0 minus 9y equals 3. That's going to cancel out. So I'm left with negative 9y equals 3. And if I divide those both out, I have y equals negative 3 ninths or negative 1 third. And we notice that if I use the original equation, I'll get 1 half and negative 1 third. If I use this equation and I cover up and say, okay, if I plug in y equals 0, that's going to be 1 half. If I plug in x equals 0 and that cancels out, that's still going to be negative 1 third. So it doesn't matter if you use the, the original or the simplified version, which is why we kind of skipped it over. The only issue that we see right here is if I plug in a 1 half and a negative 1 third, that's going to be a very difficult, accurate line to draw. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand my horizons a little bit and zoom in on this graph, which means I'm going to make my x's by 0 0.1. I'm going to make them tenths. I'm going to do the same to my y's. Each block is no longer one unit. It's one tenth of a unit, which means I need 10 blocks to have one unit, which is going to allow me for my x of 1, 2, 3, 4, 0 0.5, and my y of negative 0.3 repeating. And simply by zooming in on the graph, it allows me to get a much more accurate example of what that line looks like. So I have a 6x minus 9y equals 3. Boom. And there we go. So today we're going to be graphing an inequality. Now this is just like what we've been doing where we're graphing a line. The only thing is when we graph the line, in this case it's going to be a border. We're either going to be shading above or below the line. And our line itself is going to be saying, hey, this is the starting point or this is the ending point. And the way we're going to tell that is if we have a less than or greater than dotted lines because our line itself is not included in the graph. If I have a less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, that means it's going to be a solid line. It's going to be part of the solution set. So I'll go ahead and do that. The next thing is we're going to test a point on either side to see if the result is a true statement. And we always shade the side of true statements because we always want truth to be part of our solution sets. And I'm actually gonna show you another method that might help you out a little more than that. So let's take a look at the first one. This one's already in slope intercept form. So I know the fact that we're going to start at the number of four. I'm actually gonna do this in a different color so we can see it a little better. Apparently blue's not the best. And I'm going to move, because my slope right here is a negative 3 over 1. So I have the choice to put the negative on the top and make it a negative 3 over a positive 1, or a positive 3 over a negative 1, both of which reduce down to a negative 3. So I can either go down 1, 2, 3, and over 1, 
Or let's say there wasn't room on this end of the graph, I could go up three and back one. Seeing as I don't need to go in this direction, this should suffice. So let's go ahead. And if we notice, my line's not exactly accurate, but it's gonna be a solid line because I have this right here, solid. The next thing I'm gonna do is I need to test a point on the other side to see if the statement's true. So what I'm going to test is I'm going to test a point right here to see if this is a true statement. Zero, zero. So if I plug in zero into my equation, zero for y and zero for x, if it's to be included in my graph, this must be true. So if I plug this in, negative three times zero is zero, and zero plus four is four. Is zero less than four? Yes. So if that is true, I know I'm going to shade the side with my point because all the other points, that is true, it checks out. All the other points that I could have tested are also all going to be true, which means that my graph is going to be shaded on that side of the graph. Let's try another one. Now in the next one, I notice in this case, it's going to be a dotted line because I don't have the equal to sign included in my inequality. I'm gonna start at negative 3 fourths, which is not quite a whole. So I'm gonna start right about right here. And from there, I'm gonna move up one and over two. So up one and over two. And if we notice, I'm not on an intersection because I started at negative three-fourths. So I'm gonna stay, should have drawn a little farther low, but I'm gonna stay in between those. And in this case, because I want a dotted line, I'm gonna pick my pen up several times as I'm drawing this. That means the points on my line are not part of my set, only the points beside it. Okay. And so I'm gonna test a point. Now typically I don't test a point this close to the line. You wanna pick a point that's much farther away, but zero, zero is generally a good point to try out because we know zero is above that point, so I know it's on this part of the graph. Zero is definitely not over here, so when I try it out, let's see what we get. So I get one half minus three fourths. If I plug in zero for my y and zero for my x, these cancel out, so zero is greater than zero minus three fourths. Is zero bigger than negative three fourths? Yes, that is true, which means I'm going to shade the side with that point because that point quite literally checks out. If I'd happen to pick a point somewhere else, I'd get an untrue statement. So just to try that out, let's try this point of negative five or five negative five. If I were to plug that into my equation, I should get an untrue statement, which means I don't shade this side. Let's try it. So if I have a one half, that's three fourths, negative five, five. Okay, so what I've got right here is I have is negative five greater than five halves minus three fourths. If I change that into fourths, that's gonna be negative five is greater than 10 fourths minus 3 fourths. So negative 5 is greater than 7 fourths. So first off, I don't really care what the fraction is. A negative is not bigger than a positive. So this is going to be a false statement, which means I do not shade this side of the graph. I have to shade the other side. So no matter which side you test, if it's true, shade with the point. If it's false, shade the other side. 
try one that's not in standard form. Now, many of you will convert this to standard form, and that works. What we're going to do here is I'm going to show you how to test the x and y intercepts. So if I have an x-intercept, I know I need a zero height, which means my y must be zero. To find my y-intercept, I need a zero width, which means my x needs to be zero. So let's see what we get. So if I have 2x plus blank is 4, 2 blank plus y is less than 4. So what I'm going to do in each case is I'm going to plug in a 0 for the y, and we're going to plug in a 0 for the x. So I know that that's zeroed out, so 2x is less than 4. If I divide both sides by 2, x is less than 2. So like I said, this is kind of a cheaty way. If I have a 2, I know my x is less than, I know I'm going to be shading to the left, because that's where my lesser values are. If I solve for y, y is less than 4, I'm going to go put a point at 4. I know I'm going to be shading down, because that's where my lesser values are. And if you notice, let's connect this with a dotted line. They're both pointing to the same side of the line. They're both pointing to this side. And so what I've done with this method is not only have I found the points I need to graph, at the same time I have found the sides I need to shade. I don't even need to test the point right here. I could if I wanted to. I could test the point 0, 0, but it's unnecessary at this point. So if I tested 2 times 0 plus 0 is less than 4, and I tried to plug it in. I know that cancels, that cancels. Is 0 less than 4? Yes, that is true, which means that I would, in fact, shade this side. But I didn't need to because I already knew, based off the y-intercept and based off the x-intercept, that I was shading that part of the graph. So let's do a few more just like that. If I have something like this, I'm going to test the x intercept, which means I need a 0 height, and the y intercept, which means I need a 0 x. So if I plug that in, I know if I have a y of 0, I'm going to cover up my y and say, okay, 2x is less than negative 3. And to find my x of 0, I'm going to cover this up and say, okay, 2y is less than or equal to negative 3. And then I just solve these. Okay. Divide each side by 2. x is less than or equal to negative 3 halves. And on this one, divide by 2. y is less than or equal to negative 3 halves. So what I've got is I have my negative 3 halves. It's in between 1 and 2. My x is at negative 3 halves. It's in between negative 1 and 2. And I know it's less than or equal to, which means I should have done this in a different color but oh well. Less than and less than. If I were to connect them with a line, I notice that both of them are pointing on the same side. That lets me know that I've done my math correct. I know which side I need to shade. So let's assume on this one, we're going to try this one. Let's say we miss one of these. How will that look? How will we know to go back and check our work? Let's see. So in this case, I've got to do a little bit of rearranging. I've got to move this y over, which is going to give me a 4y. I also have to move this x over. So both those go away. And I'll have a 4x. Oh, nope, it's a negative 2. Negative 2x. Let me rewrite that. Negative 2x plus 4y is less than 8. So let's say that I screwed up on one of these. And when I'm finding my x-intercept with a y of 0, 
in my y-intercept of an x of 0, I miss one of the signs. What would that look like? Well, my y is equal to 0, if you believe that's actually what that says right there. That means that I don't have a y term. I just have a negative 2x is less than 8. This one, if my x is 0, I just have a 4y is less than 8. So I think you might see where I'm going with this. We know that when we divide by a negative number, we flip the sign, so negative 4. On this, if I divide by 4, I get y is less than 2. So if we didn't notice that we flipped the sign, let's see what would happen. Well, if x is greater than negative 4, I know that I'm shading to the right. But if I didn't catch the sign flip, I would have inadvertently said, hey, we need to shade to the left, which we know this is not true. So I'm going to do it in red so we can tell the difference. y is less than 2, which means I shade down because that's where my lesser values are. And I'm going to connect this point with a dotted line. So one of the reasons why I like the intercept method is because it allows you to check your work. If I didn't catch the sign flip, this would be saying shade above the line, and this would be shading below the line. I'd be like, OK, which way do I shade? I don't know. But because I know that they have to be pointing in the same direction, I know to go back and say, oh, I divided by a negative. That must mean the sign flips. Oh. Now they're pointing in the same direction. So now I know that it's actually this side of the graph. Bingo. And so let's do the last one. Now the last one just says, hey, I'm plugging in an A value where I see my A. I'm plugging in a B value where I see my B, and a C value where I see my C. So I get a 4x minus 12y is less than or equal to 20. Let's go ahead and knock this out. x-intercept of y of 0, my y-intercept of x of 0. So I know if my y is 0, I'm going to cover up my y term. 4x is less than or equal to 20. For my x of 0, I'm going to cover up my x term. 12y is less than or equal to 20. We know there's going to be a sign change because of that negative coefficient. So if we're using this method and we don't notice that, we'll notice that we're conflicting ourselves. But we're going to catch that ahead of time because we're good like that. If I divide each side by 4, I get a point at 5. Divide each side by negative 12. Flip the sign, 20 over 12. I know I can reduce that both by 4, so negative 5 thirds. So let's go put a point at 5 less than negative 5 thirds, which is almost negative 2, and it's greater than, which means I shade up and to the left. I'm going to draw a solid line because I have the line included. And so what I see is that they're both saying shade above or shade to the left, and luckily I have an above and to the left side. And there we go. So today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be graphing absolute value. Now, Absolute value is going to be a V-shaped graph. And today what we're going to do is we're going to graph the parent graph and we're going to prove a few common transformations. A common way to approach this subject is to simply just graph lots of different absolute values and kind of figure out what's going on. But we're going to take a much more structured approach. Um, to start, we're going to graph the parent function. And I think this is the most important part about 
graphing an absolute value is what does the absolute value look like when I haven't moved it up, down, I haven't stretched it or squished it, and I haven't flipped it? Because we're gonna end up proving today all four of these rules so that if you ever forget, you know how to come back up with a new set of rules. Again, a lot of students feel that they just need to memorize these rules, and that does work good, it does speed you up, but if you forget how the graph is actually working, it can hold you back if you forget, well, is plus up or is plus down? I don't remember because it's kind of back and forth with the inside and the outside. So let's build a graph and see how we came up with these rules. So my parent graph, I'm gonna graph x, y. I know because this is unmoved, I'm gonna pick some numbers right around the origin. And yes, these are just random numbers. Um, we're gonna stick with these for now because these are right around the center and most of my graphs today are gonna to be right around the center. So if I plug these values in, actually I'm gonna do this in blue because this is the parent. I have the absolute value of absolute value of negative two, absolute value of negative one, zero, one, and two. And as we all know, the absolute value is gonna turn this into a positive number, and boom. I have my parent function. So I'm gonna put a point at negative two, two, at negative one, one, zero, zero, one, one, and two, two. And there's my V. I know that if I graph this, it's gonna stay a perfect diagonal going up and to the left and up and to the right. Perfect. And now this graph is the graph that we're gonna change with all these different transformations that we're doing today. So what I'm gonna do is every time that we have a graph is I'm going to graph a copy image of this parent just so that we can see in case we've forgotten all the rules up top, what's happened. And so there's my parent. So let's take, again, some random numbers, but let's see what happened to this graph when I add one inside the brackets. So negative two plus one is negative one, which is gonna end up being a positive one. That's gonna be the absolute value of zero, which is zero, one, which is one, two, which is two, and three, which is three. Don't know what I just did right there. I think I couldn't decide whether I wanted to write an equal sign or a three and ended up writing both. So as I start to graph these, negative two, one, and negative one, zero, it looks like my graph could have either shifted to the left, or maybe it's shifted down, or maybe it's completely different and it's now a V opening downward off to the left. We don't know. But if I continue to graph it, what we notice is that, hey, the graph hasn't shifted downward, it hasn't flipped, all it's done is it's moved exactly one unit to the left, which is why our general rule is if you're adding a value inside the brackets, that means it's a leftward motion. And so now we've proven that. So my y equals the absolute value of x plus one. Awesome. And so my rule for the day is that is left. Try another one. Again, I like to draw the parent function just so we can see what's going on. I'm gonna label it. Ooh, this isn't adding inside the in brackets, it's subtracting. Which, if we do a little bit of intuition, that's the opposite of what we we're doing up here. I bet you this is gonna be a rightward motion. Let's see if we're right. Let's try it out. So 
So I'm going to plug in my points, and I'm going to plug them into the absolute value brackets. Negative 2 minus 2 is negative 4, which is 4. That's going to be negative 3, which is 3. Negative 2, which is 2. Negative 1, which is 1. And 0, which is 0. So, unfortunately, what I'm seeing is a straight line. And so if we look at the graph and we think, okay, this should be either a left or right motion, well, that means that quite possibly that's the vertex, because 1, 2. So I bet you if I graph the point right after that, if I plug in an x of 3 down here at the bottom, 3 minus 2 equals, see the absolute value of 1, yes, it bounces back up. So our guess that we wrote at the very beginning. Simply looking at what the graph did and what it did right here, excuse my wonky curvy line, is going to be a rightward motion. So let's try another one here. And just instead of inside, let's do one outside. So I'm going to graph my parent function yet again. I'm going to label it. It's at the origin, it's a V, it's a perfect diagonal. And I want to see what's going on with this graph. So I'm going to pick a set of random points, which for most of these are just going to be right around the same points, and I'm going to plug them all in. Here's where a common mistake that's made at this level happens, is a lot of students look at the absolute value brackets and they're like, okay, cool, my answer can't be negative, which is for the most part correct, but we got to be careful that it's only what's inside these brackets. It's not the whole answer. It's not why they can't be negative, otherwise I would have put the brackets around y. x is the only thing that can't be negative. What I do after that has nothing to do with it. So as long as I make this negative 2 a positive 2, I can still take away 4 and get a negative 2 as my answer. And so, again, a lot of students will look at that and say, negative 2, well, I have an absolute value. That can't be negative. That must be positive. And they'll change it at the very end. Remember, what we're not writing, what we're not writing here is we're not saying y is the absolute value of x minus 4. Take that and make it absolute value. We're not doing this. We're only making the x value positive. So it's a very common mistake. Just make sure that we don't do that. 1 minus 4 is going to give me a negative 3. 0 minus 4 is a negative 4. 1 minus 4 is a negative 3. 2 minus 4 is a negative 2. So again, all my answers were negative and if I didn't know what was going on and I wasn't confident in what I was doing, that would be a little alarming. And you might have a little bit of second guessing going on if you were trying to submit that for a test or wherever you were going. Perfect. And so when we look at this, we can come up with a rule. Well, hey, I know what inside and out inside means. If I add inside, that's left. And if I subtract inside, that's right. Well, I bet you if I subtract outside, well, it looks like my graph moved down. So the inverse would be if the graph moves up. So, so now that we've proven this, let's go ahead and see it in action. So I'm going to graph my parent function. And this time, I'm just going to look at this and say, okay, I remember these rules. That is a leftward motion if we add inside the brackets. 
and that is an upward motion if I add outside. So I'm going to take my vertex and move it left one and up two and pop it right there. And I'm going to redraw this V at that spot. And say this is my Y equals X plus one plus two. There we go. That's all we need. And so for the final question today, I want you to pause the video real quick and give that one a shot and see how you do. Pay special attention to this negative on the out front. So pause it, resume the video when you're done, and check your work. Okay, so let's see how we're doing. Well, I know I have a graph that moves right and up. So if I have my V right here, which is my parent, and I move my graph left or right to up to, that negative is going to throw me off a little bit. So in essence, what I'm going to have to do on this one is I'm going to have to build a table just to double check. Many of you might have already figured out what that negative means and what the graph's going to look like, but I'm going to go ahead and double check, and I'm going to pick some points right around here. Now, normally I'd pick negative 2 to 2, but I know where my vertex is, so I really only care what's the left and right at that point. So about like a negative 1, 0, and 1. 0 just to make sure I'm doing this right. Negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3. The absolute value is a positive 3. Then it's a negative 3 again. Plus 2 is negative 1. 0. Again, I'm not really sure why I picked a 0. I picked 1, 2, 3. I picked 3 points to the left of my point. It's too late now, but we're going to give it a shot to see what it looks like. It's going to be a negative 2 which became positive, and then negative again, plus 2. So that's a 0. 1 minus 2 is negative 1, positive, because of the brackets, negative, because of the sign, plus 2. I already know what I'm plugging in for right there, and so I just want to do one more on the other side. Zero plus two. That's going to be a one. A negative one plus two is one. So what we see is, I see this leading up, and then I see it coming back down, which means that, oh, kind of bent it. If I have a negative sign, it does move right and up. That negative means that the V went from opening up to opening down. There we go.